how do we engage with consumers and society. Uh, I'm Ole Peterson, uh, Vice President of Academia Europea and member of the SAPIA Board, and it's my uh, privilege to chair this uh, meeting together with Brian Norton from the Royal Irish Academy. So very quickly, uh, the program uh, is on the next slide. Uh, so we are here at the uh, welcoming remarks. After that, we will hear key evidence and recommendations. And after that, there are three discussion sessions on attitudes and behavior change, marketing and sustainability and policy aspects. Just a few words about uh, SAPIA uh, from me. SAPIA is a consortium of five pan-European networks, which are on the screen right now. And in response to requests from the European Commission, SAPIA produces evidence review reports in particular areas. And the one we are discussing today is obviously the biodegradability of plastics, but you also see a few other examples of evidence reviews we have made. And these uh, evidence review reports then are the basis for the scientific opinion that will be expressed by the scientific uh, advisors to the European Commission. This can then give rise to policy proposals by the College of European Commissioners, eventually uh, uh, go into legislation and regulations. And you see also on this slide the two reports that are sort of uh, published simultaneously, namely the evidence review report to the left and the scientific opinion to the right. An important part of the scientific uh, advice mechanism is that both the evidence review reports and the scientific opinion are in the public uh, domain. So uh, just a few practical uh, remarks. Uh, for those of you who want to submit questions, use exclusively the Q&A portal uh, to do that. The webinar is being recorded. And so everyone can go back and listen afterwards and recommend uh, listen to other people. So uh, just now I will hand over to uh, Brian Norton from the Royal Irish Academy to say a few welcoming remarks from our co-organizers. So, uh, Brian, please. Thank you. I'd like to begin by welcoming everyone to this very topical and timely webinar hosted by Sapia and the Royal Irish Academy to discuss implications of the International Evidence Review Report, Biodegradability of Plastics in the Open Environment. This webinar brings interdisciplinary perspectives and insights to this very important topic. The Royal Irish Academy is proud to be a member of SAPEA and we're involved in several SAPEA and EU policy projects that Academy members and Irish experts have contributed to. Academy nominated Irish based experts have made significant contributions to European policy projects and issues including sustainable food systems, science advice mechanisms and food from the ocean. We are honoured to be joined here today by eminent guests and speakers. We have a very diverse audience with people joining us from government and academic departments, NGOs, the media and the public from all over the globe. As the Royal Irish Academy's Policy and International Relations Secretary, I would like to express a warm welcome in particular to our wide range of impressive speakers and I look forward to hearing from them shortly. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Brian. And now, without any further ado, we move to the first sort of real part of it, namely the key evidence and recommendations, which will be presented by uh, Alessandro Alekara from the European Commission, Walter Potinka, who is a member of the SAPIA Working Group from Cardiff University, and Tatiana Filatova, who also was a member of the SAPIA Working Group, uh, and who is from Trent University in the Netherlands. So, I will now give the word, I guess, to Alessandro Aleka, who will start this presentation. Thank you, Ola. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alessandro Allegra. I'm a policy officer at the European Commission, working uh, in support of the Group of Chief Scientific Advisors. And as Ola mentioned, the Group of Chief Scientific Advisors is an independent expert group that provides uh, advice to the College of Commissioners. Uh, based on the evidence reviews provided by SAPEA. So my role as a uh, policy officer is to support the chief scientific advisors 
but the scientific opinion represents their uh, opinion is not uh, a position of the European Commission, but is a recommendation made by the independent advisors to the Commission. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, uh, next one. So the scientific opinion on biodegradable plastic uh, tackles the issue of uh, plastic pollution uh, and comes at the request of uh, the, the former commissioner for the environment uh, who asked the chief scientific advisor the scoping question. From a scientific point of view and end of life perspective, uh, applying plastic, uh, applying to plastics that biodegrade either into crystal river in the environment and considering the waste hierarchy and circular economy approach, what are the criteria and corresponding applications of such plastics that are beneficial to the environment compared with non biodegradable plastics? So a very specific question that was asked to the advisors about uh, applications of biodegradable plastics in the open environment, which can be beneficial uh, to the environment. And next slide, please. Uh, after considering the evidence review uh, prepared by SAPEA, uh, the advisors recommended the commission that uh, it adopts a definition of biodegradability as a system property, which takes into account the material properties of the plastic but also the specific environmental conditions in which biodegradation takes place. Uh, and I think this is the key recommendation that emerged from the report, uh, that biodegradability needs to be considered as a system property. And this needs to be reflected uh, in the testing and certification regime, but also in the way information is conveyed to users and consumers through labeling uh, and information. So making it clear uh, that uh, biodegradation happens different in different environments, and this has uh, implications for how it's used and how it's regulated. Uh, and the key recommendation uh, is following the waste hierarchy. So uh, biodegradable plastics are not uh, a solution to littering. They're not a silver bullet, but rather part of a broader waste uh, strategy, which aims at uh, reducing, reusing, and recycling first, and only considers biodegradation for specific applications. Now I will leave the floor to the members of the SAPEA expert working group who will tell you more about the content of the evidence review. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. So what I'd like to do in this part of the presentation uh, is to give you an overview of chapter six, which is on the social behavioral and policy aspects uh, of biodegradable uh, plastics. Uh, now, this chapter was uh, co-authored by Tatiana Filatova and me, and Tatiana Filatova will uh, do the third part of this presentation. And I would also like to mention Rosie Havers, uh, who also made a substantial contribution to uh, the chapter. Now, to say a little bit about uh, the background, which you probably will be familiar with, but it is about plastics. And the production and use of plastics has grown substantially since the 1950s. And uh, you could say that modern life is now unthinkable without them. Almost every aspect of modern life you know, has been pervaded by plastics. Now, plastics, they are a wonderful material, so they're versatile, they're easy to produce, and most of all, they're very, very convenient. Uh, but the problem is, is that only a very small amount of them are being recycled and reused. So most of the plastics will end up either in landfill or in the open environment. Now, that's the reason why biodegradable plastics are often seen as a solution to plastic pollution. Um, but of course, it is not uh, as uh, simple because if you're introducing a new material like biodegradable plastics into a complex system that we also know as a society, now there's many different sectors and there's many different actors who will behave each in their own individual way and also who will make decisions. So then there may be unintended uh, consequences. Now, uh, what we try to do in the chapter is to consolidate the evidence uh, on biodegradable plastics or the, bio the biodegradability of plastics in the open environment, uh, and then in particular how they are perceived, understood, uh, and used by consumers and other actors. Now, there were four parts of this chapter, so we looked at uh, perceptions and behavior in relation to biodegradable plastics, but also biodegradable packaging in general. Uh, we have been uh, looking at unintended uh, economic, behavioral, and environmental consequences, 
and also a substantial part of the chapter was on the labeling of biodegradable plastics. And in particular, we were looking at what labeling is needed and what the limitations of labeling are. And then Tatjana will say a little bit more about evidence-based policy options and regulations, and in particular about information, market-based policies, and regulatory uh, policies. Now, what the chapter concluded is, is that there's considerable consumer confusion about bioplastics in general and biodegradable plastics in particular. And that has much to do with a bio prefix because the bio prefix that gives the uh, idea that it is environmentally friendly, that it is sustainable. Uh, also the bio prefix is used in um, organically produced uh, products and also you have associations with that when you're talking about uh, plastics. On top of that, there's quite some consumer confusion about end of life functionality. So the recyclability, the biodegradability and compostability of products. In particular, the distinction between biodegradable and compostable is not always understood. So biodegradability is understood by the public as something that will biodegrade in the open environment um, uh, as we would understand as something that is compostable. So there might be very technical definitions about biodegradable plastics and compostable plastics, but there's not a clear distinction among the general public. Now, as part of the review, we also looked at bi biodegradable packaging in general, because there was not a lot of literature on biodegradable plastics in particular. And there you can see that consumers really like efforts to make packaging more sustainable. But there is a mismatch between com consumer understanding and life, life cycle assessments. Yes, whereas the public thinks that cardboard, for example, or plastics uh, and glass uh, are very environmentally uh, sustainable, uh, they have a high environmental uh, impact. And it's the same with biodegradable plastics. Now, in this chapter, we also uh, attempted to identify a number of unintended consequences, and I will highlight three here. Yeah, so first of all, there's the material rebound effect or potential material rebound effect. So because of lowered environmental concerns about the usage of biodegradable materials, people may use more of them. Now, an associated unintended consequence could, could be an increase in littering. And we already see that people are, have less problems with materials that are being littered if they're biodegradable. And it might also be the case for plastics. Now, on top of that, also conventional plastics may be littered more because it's very difficult for the consumers to see the difference between biodegradable plastics and conventional fossil-based uh, plastics. Now, a third unintended consequence is that they may end up in the wrong waste stream. So, so research has shown that compostable bio-based packaging are more likely to be discarded incorrectly. So they may end up in a, a wrong waste stream and that may also lead to certain kind of issues. Now, uh, an important part uh, of the report was on labeling. Now it's difficult for consumers to distinguish between bio-based biodegradable uh, plastics and um, uh, conventional uh, plastics because they feel and they, they look the same. So labeling is absolutely essential. Now, info about the provenance of materials, you know, they may be relevant for sustainability uh, decisions. They have little meaning in terms of what to do after the end uh, of the materials being uh, used. And as you can see on this slide, there's many different labels and there are many different uh, certification schemes. And it may be very difficult to make a sense of that. Now, a main problem relates to with what to do post-consumption with the materials post-consumption. Yeah, what do you do with them? Can you recycle them? Can you compost them? Or do you put them in the green bin? So one aspect that we have looked into is that what uh, it is not sufficient just to show that it is biodegradable, but it should also have instructions what you should do with it and what you should not do with it. And here you can see examples of the two. And that's it for me. And I will now give over to Tatjana Filatova. Thank you very much, Walter. And um, indeed, so um, 
as Walter highlighted, uh, there is a, a, a there could be a confusion on the consumer side in terms of what to do with uh, with the biodegradable plastics, and to um, to remediate the negative impacts of this um, unintended con consequences, which were of course not meant, there could be a number of policy instruments um, introduced. Uh, in addition to labeling, um, among the information policies, um, several others like educational programs on nudging have been discussed in the literature. What we did find uh, a bit, uh, there, there is an inclination that maybe information policies beyond labeling might not be um, as effective because they could raise awareness, but there's still a, a gap between the awareness and action. Uh, so uh, some clever ways of designing nudging um, uh, have been discussed in the literature, but uh, not, not exact proposals have been uh, made with respect to biodegradable plastics. For plastics in general, yes, like a re <laughs> getting away of plast with plastics altogether, but um, nothing specific yet for biodegradable plastics. It has been also discussed that in addition to information policies, um, we could use uh, various market-based incentives. Um, of course, taxes and subsidies are the ones that have been discussed uh, mostly. And they have been, and the scientific literature does provide some evidence on a number of those instruments, mostly for um, uh, consumers in the agricultural sector. And of course, uh, why, why do these uh, market-based instruments that were needed in the first place is between, because the prices of biodegradable plastics might be higher than, th than those of conventional. So uh, to, to, to promote the uptake of biodegradable plastics um, has been uh, studied that uh, different instruments have been studied, uh, such as, for example, tax credits or uh, extended producer responsibility schemes. And uh, in, in recently, there have been several experiments done in the field uh, and uh, where they actually, for example, in for farmers, where um, there is evidence that tax credits, for example, um, are most preferred uh, compared to any other um, instruments, market-based instruments, because they actually have lower transaction costs in terms of administrative process. So this is maybe something uh, to keep in mind, but it has been also studied um, in, in the domain of trade and retail with different eco-credential schemes, as well as on the uh, consumption side for the households, uh, where um, uh, people are discussing uh, different pay-as-you-throw uh, schemes and subsidies for home uh, composting equipment. Lastly, uh, we could appeal to the regulatory policies um, uh, with uh, bans, uh, um, uh, with banning uh, some use of plastic, some different types of plastic, biodegradable plastic, or I don't know, plastics that um, maybe are more harmful. But also, what has been discussed a lot is that really certification and certification has to uh, be done at the international level with the international agreements, because of course a lot of this um, uh, the consumers <laughs> meet this biodegradable plastics usually in the packaging and those goods uh, could travel around the world. Next slide, please, Walter. And um, with this in mind, uh, uh, it, it's worth uh, coming back to what Walter has already mentioned, the rebound effect. Uh, what we do know as well from other uh, new technologies is that as soon as a more resource efficient technology is introduced, we might expect actually increasing use of the resource or let's say increasing disposal of uh, plastics, uh, biodegradable plastics as well. The, we are at the very early stage, so there have not been uh, studies done on that yet, but uh, we do know from other technological improvements that that could be the case. And it's extremely important to still have access to, to the disposable, disposal facility, uh, facilities so that uh, uh, the, the common uh, um, recycling streams are not contaminated. And next slide, please. Um, so I would like to finish on us behalf uh, on the scientific evidence with a few key messages, with one being really that the fact that benefits of biodegradable plastics could not be achieved without a proper understanding uh, by consumer what to do with them and how to differentiate. 
um, and uh, and uh, technical terminology does not always um, <laughs> um, come straightforward to the consumer. So consumers could be confused also about the disposal routes and the degradation properties. So clear standardization, standardized labeling is extremely important. And um, but then, but it's not sufficient for the successful transition. So you also have to complement it with market-based policies and regulations to really change behavior. Awareness alone does not lead to the behavior change. And um, uh, so, and more increasingly, so you could uh, also think of um, understanding what would be the cross-sectoral impacts and the rebound effects. But we're not yet there with this technology. I think. I think it's all on ours on my side. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, Vauta, and Alessandro. I'm Richard Thompson. I'm Professor of Marine Biology at the University of Plymouth. I've been working on plastics in the environment for nearly 20 years, and I've also contributed to the evidence review that, uh, that Tatiana, and Vauta, and Alessandro have just summarized. I'm an environmental scientist. Today, the focus is on solutions, and that's why I'm delighted to be moderating the afternoon session. We have three different sections, attitudes and behavior, marketing and sustainability, and then policy aspects. For each section, there'll be some presentations followed by an opportunity for questions and answers, which I will moderate. And, and we need to steer those questions and answers towards the content of the individual sessions. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Sabina Pal and um, Shane Timmons, who will be discussing, first of all, attitudes and behavior change, which will be followed by question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I can't share my screen at the moment. Maybe I can now. Okay, can you hear, can you see my screen? Yeah. Great. Um, so uh, very quickly, I've only got a few minutes to summarize a few things. My contribution will be to emphasize some aspects and highlight some remaining questions. And thank you very much for inviting me to this fascinating discussion. So first off, I wanted to um, refer to the statement, the observation, the report made that the benefits of biodegradable plastic will not be achieved without the consumer. I think that's a really important observation. And building on this, I think there are three points here. One thing is it's really important that we keep the key messages to the public, to the consumer, to prioritize reduction, reuse, and recycling, as the report says. That's really important. Don't confuse people. Don't encourage the linear use where the thinking is biodegradable degradable materials can end up in the environment. It doesn't matter. That's a really important point. And also keep the no littering message. We don't want to confuse people who are already doing many things in the right way. The second point about understanding of the public or consumer understanding has been made already. Again, I think it's really important to bear in mind how um, complex materials have become. The technology in the materials is extremely complicated. People struggle with this and that's why they're confused. I think the labeling and information campaigns as a solution is really important. I just wanted to say one thing in addition to this, bear in mind the limits, limitation to human cognitive capacity. We can't entirely rely on the um, careful decisions. Tatiana earlier said about nudges are important. We've heard the system is important. So bear this in mind and really look at this labeling confusion as well. It's interesting to see all these different labels that already exist. And that's also a question of trust in the system. If we have labels, people need to trust that this is right and then finally behavior many people want to do the right thing we must make it feasible and i wanted to very quickly show you some results we've we've got recently where we asked a sample of a thousand uk um, people general public um, what they would do when they have to dispose of a plastic bag and we said the plastic bag is made of one of four materials we haven't got time to look at all the options i just want to point out one thing the turquoise bar shows the number of don't knows. And if you look on the left hand side, we've got biodegradable and compostable materials. The don't knows are relatively small. That seems to be okay. At least people have a basic idea what could be done. On the right hand side, where we have bio based and oxidegradable materials, we added this in as well. 
the don't knows are very high. So these are frequencies, for example, for oxidegradable, nearly 600 out of 1,000 people said, I don't know. I haven't got an idea what to do with this at all. So that's just going, um, reiterating the behavioral component. And then finally, I want to say a little bit about the people to system transition, which is really important and again is stressed very much in the report. Um, it's about consumer and beyond, I think. We need to connect the dots from the development of new materials via the system pathways to the end user and post use. And I really liked that you mentioned specific sectors and actors such as farming, fishing. Um, uh, the point was made about bio. It appears to be a good thing, has posit positive connotations. People like bio because it makes them feel good. They want to do the right thing. Um, but the detail isn't necessarily understood. Some of the research has pointed this out. And this might also benefit some greenwashing where people put a bio label on. And yeah, we don't really know what this means. The final point I want to make is the link to risk perception. So do we actually know what people think about biodegradable plastic packaging that protects food, for example? We know people are highly concerned about microplastics. Is this less for plastic that is made from bio-based materials? Do they distinguish these things? And that's just a picture illustrating a campaign a few years back. And finally, I just wanted to say congratulations on a great report. And in the picture, of course, these are biodegradable balloons and glitter. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine. Um, over to Shane. Hi everyone. Uh, firstly, just to say that um, Pete, who was scheduled to speak today, sends his apologies for not being able to make it. Um, I'll be standing in for him and hopefully I can convey even a fraction of his enthusiasm for applying behavioural science to policy problems. Uh, so I work with the Behavioural Research Unit, which is headed by Pete, at the Economic and Social Research Institute here in Dublin. We're publicly funded and we aim to inform policy, but importantly for us, the research we do is independent from the government. Um, turning to the topic for today's webinar, to me, if I were to choose one section of the behavioral chapter of the report um, that would be the most important, um, it would be the, the section titled, What is Not Known? Um, so I got into behavioral science to understand why people make the kinds of decisions they do. So it was a quest for, I guess, the truth of our psychology, but it's become increasingly clear to me that actually our main tasks as researchers working at the intersection of behavioral science and policy, it's not to spread truth and certainty, it's actually to spread doubt that there's a lot we don't know and you need to be open-minded in your approach to figuring out what policy will be most effective and what methods to use in trying to figure that out. So there are multiple behavioral components that are highlighted in the report. One that we've heard quite a bit already about today is uh, on labeling. So there's a vast literature that could be pulled on to inform the kinds of labels that we might design. We've actually done some work on this in our lab um, with respect to labeling of nutritional information on food. Um, but I don't think as behavioral scientists that we'll be in a position to design the perfect label that is going to perfectly convey the right information to consumers just based on the research that's been done before. We'll be able to design good candidate labels that we think on the balance of the research that's been done will help con the consumers or the other end users we've heard about make better and more informed decisions. But the key, at least from my perspective here, is that we need controlled testing of these labels. So Voter and Tatiana highlighted the risks for um, unintended consequences of policies, um, meaning that policies will require sort of active monitoring. So any labels that do roll out will, be, will need to be monitored. But I think pre-testing these gives us the opportunity to prevent this from occurring. Now, by testing here, I don't just mean the randomized control trial or the field trial, where, for example, you might select at random which plastics get which label. Um, randomized control trials are a fantastic way of telling whether a policy is going to work in the field and whether it will have the intended consequences. But the kind of work we do, we certainly believe that we can design better randomized control trials if we first diagnose the problem properly. And this diagnosis, I think, can take the form of an experiment as well, experimental tests. Um, so just to give you a very quick example of some work that we're work doing at the, at the moment in Ireland um, in collaboration with the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so we know improper household waste management is a problem, that recycling bins can be contaminated with things that are not recyclable. Um, and our aim is to test an intervention here that's going to try to improve household waste management. 
And um, so naturally we will be seeking to do a randomized control trial in the field with real households and in how they manage their, their household waste. But our first step is to understand, okay, what is, what is causing this problem? What is the psychological mechanism that underlies this decision? Is it that people don't know how to recycle properly? Is it that they tell us they're motivated, but they're not really motivated? Are the infrastructural problems? Is it a combination of all three? So to know which target uh, or which of these possible causes to target with an intervention, we're first going to conduct a few um, online experiments to begin with, with nationally representative samples. So we'll assess um, understanding using techniques from educational psychology and using interactive experimental interfaces to see how quickly and accurately people can determine, say, which products go into which bin. Um, but we'll also use techniques um, to, to assess the level of social desirability responding that might happen in surveys. So for example, if people are just telling us that they would like to, um, that they would like to recycle in order to make it seem like they're, they're more environmentally friendly and so on. And uh, so there's techniques that can be used that we've, we've used before, such as uh, a list experiment. Um, I'm just gonna give you the name, I won't go into the details because it takes quite a long time to explain. Uh, but my point here is that there are multiple ways to diagnose what that psychological mechanism, mechanism is to then understand the decision process the consumer face or another end user faces. And then we can design our randomized control trials to see which label is gonna work or which label is most likely gonna work in the, in the long run. Um, one final point uh, that I wanna note with this is a proper consideration of the outcome variables that are used in, when doing this, this sort of research. So we're increasingly finding in the kind of research that we do that the kinds of outcome variables that are often relied on in, in surveys and in focus groups may not give us the same answer as other types of outcome variables that are, are informed from more psychological perspective. Um, for example, I'm, one project I'm working on at the moment uh, is trying to communicate to people using maps the level of radon risk in their area. So how much radon gas is there? That, and are you in a high risk area um, for radon gas in Ireland, which is a bit of a problem. What the initial results seem to point is that if we ask people which maps are clearer or which ones would they recommend to someone else to use, it's maps that have a certain color scheme or certain search functionality, for example. But if instead we look at uh, outcome variables related to how much they perceive the risk of radon or how willing they are to test for radon, it's other features of the maps that crop up as important. So things like how many risk categories are used on the map. Um, that and uh, how legends are labeled to communicate that type of risk. So we would stress that the kind of um, outcome variables are things that people need to be kind of open about as well. So I could go on, but I'll wrap up here by saying that I think that there is um, an exciting opportunity here to use behavioral science uh, to help make sure the standards for using biodegradable plastics are developed in a way that can really benefit the environment. But in order to do so effectively, I think we need an open-mindedness, not just about what will be effective, but the methods we're going to use to identify what will be effective. Thanks. Right, I think thank we have you. a Q and A now. Thank you very much, Shane. So, yeah, we've got some uh, some questions appearing in the in the uh, in the Q and A. It would be good good to have more because some of them are not specifically focused on on the uh, the attitudes and behaviour change aspect, which is obviously what we're dealing with in this in this session. But one of the first questions that well, the highest voted one uh, asks: Is there any data on compostable plastic? ending up in traditional plastic waste streams and I don't know whether uh, Sabine or Shane you'd, you'd like to, to, to try for that and to some extent I think you, you hinted at the answer in, in, in one of the presentations at least of the, the confusion but maybe you could amplify a bit about the potential there. I don't know Sabine would you like to have a go? Uh, I'd like to have a go, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'm thinking the, the about uh, Tatiana will have the answer because that was referred to. Uh, maybe I can mention because I just typed the answer. Um, so we have found only one article reporting the exact data from the self-reported by consumers. And uh, the data is from the, the, the work was published in 2019. And they say that two thirds of consumers re, uh, recycle, <laughs> put, put the biodegradable plastics in their recycled bin instead of the green bin. But that's only one study, and it was confirmed by another field experiment, I think, about our, um, which where they said that the probability that it was just more likely for people to misplace the, the, <laughs> but I don't have the percentage, the exact percentage. But it would be great to re, to compare the self-reported data to the actual measurements, maybe on the recycling facilities that we didn't 
I, oh, I don't thanks, think we can... I mean, it's also clear that, that some biodegradable plastics don't tell the user how to dispose of them. So the probability of them ending up in the correct waste stream are low unless some guidance is given. Um, we've got a question here um, for Shane. Shane, why in Ireland, particularly in our cities, is there such a low uptake of, on compost bins? Uh, that is something that our research is going to try to figure out. I'm afraid I don't have the answer for that at the moment. Um, so that we're designing this this research at the moment. I can just speak briefly to that um, previous question. So I don't have the exact figures on um, biodegradable plastics or uh, landing in the, the recycling bin. But one of the main reasons for us being commissioned to conduct this research on household waste management are things like um, compostable coffee cups, ending up in the recycling bin, which is very much kind of reducing the, the utility then of that entire recycling bin as it turns to, to mush and contaminates the rest. So that is certainly a problem. And then, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have an answer on the, the uptake of compost bins in, in Dublin and other cities. Yeah, OK, that, that, thank you. Um, there's a question here that, 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 I, that is quite interesting. So. Again, it's one that might not be a perfect answer to, but I think I'd, I'd welcome the thoughts of the uh, of you both on it. Is it being considered to re regulate the use of green and flowers and leaves on consumer products uh, that are bio-based compostable in their labeling? Um, the, the, one of the slides that was presented, I think, was full of green labels, pretty explanatory with regards to what could cause consumers to think these products are safe in the environment. So, you know, anything, anything to regulate, how should we go about communicating to the consumers? Um, I, yeah, uh, go on, Walter. Yes, yeah. yes let, let's say a little bit. I, I'm not sure that I, I, I am able to, to, to answer the question. It's also, it's a very complex question as well, because th there's lots of different aspects uh, to it. Uh, what, what I try to show with the, uh, uh, all the different labels, is there's, there's many different schemes and the consumer has to make sense of them and they all reflect something right and maybe there's a very good technical definition for that what you can and cannot do with that but that's not absolutely clear from the labels uh, directly so if there's a leave uh, then people may think well it is compostable and i put it with the rest of my my, my compost i do compost it at home whereas could uh, refer to let's say industrial composting yeah, so uh, th that is the whole problem with it. So, so we may know what they mean. It may not be absolutely clear to the consumer. And that's why I was also mentioned, it needs to be explicit what you should and should not do with the materials. And only then it will be clear. Okay, that, thank you. Uh, um, I'm just mindful of the time and there's some great questions coming in that they're not necessarily uh, focused on things Shane and Sabine uh, covered, but I mean, we, we've opened it up and Wouter's just given answers. So I think I'm gonna carry on in this mode of a kind of free for all, if that's okay with the, with the panelists that are here. Um, do we understand based on these presentations that behavioral science is going to be used to develop new standards for open environment biodegradable plastics? So, you know, how, how important do we think the role of, not how important, but is it actually gonna be used in guiding the standards? Any, any comments on, 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 on that? Can I just comment on, on this comment? <laughs> I think it's desirable, definitely desirable. I think that's the understanding of the report and of many people working in this area, that there is input from the behavioral sciences. I don't think the behavioral sciences on their own can, can define a standard because that's also a technical question. So we need to work together towards this aim of having a standard that people trust and that also works in different environments. And so it's a complex question that we need to work on together. Yeah, no, no, I think that wasn't the implication that you'd fix the whole problem. But yeah, keep, keep a keep art. If the consumer doesn't understand how it's labeled, what hope do we have if it's, uh, you know, if it's an everyday packaging or something like that? Yeah, very good. OK, um, so I just take uh, one um, one last question. Um, what do you think about simplifying the labeling system so that, you know, the label is basically yes, no, I can be recycled. Um, rather than perhaps going into lots of details about, about many different um, waste streams or recyclability or compostability. So simplifying, I think, the, the answer, the, the information to the consumer. 
if if I could say something about it, and I, I will keep it keep it short. There was also a different question: Do we need a you know a, a different label or a different uh, yeah. scheme? And and the answer there is no. So it is better to simplify it because at the moment consumers are overwhelmed. There's many different schemes. It's very difficult to make sense of them. So simplification is part of that. Yes. Can I add? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, can I just add to that? There's a, there are also questions about um, council saying, but don't compost here, even if something says compostable on a product or an item. And that's obviously a really big challenge as well. We need to not just simplify the labeling, but also the systems that they get used in. And there's no easy answer to this, but that's, yep. I think, what things should try. No, thank you, Sabine. Well, lots of good questions coming in. Remember with the, the uh, question and answer function, you can vote up questions so uh, please try and do that because I'm now we've got uh, 20 or 30 questions I'm going to be prioritizing from the ones voted up to the top of the list so so please do to do that but without more ado I want to move on now to the next section which is focused on um, marketing and sustainability and I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Klaus and Samantha who, who are going to present on that section thank you so good afternoon from my side I'm Klaus Menrad. I'm professor for marketing of bio-based resources in Straubing at the University of Weinstefan Triestorp. So I want to give you some insights on marketing issues related to biodegradable products. And my first remark goes in the direction that we must think about value networks and the value change in which these biodegradable products are included. And currently it's the case that these products are part of very differing value networks. And we have a lot of actors being active in these networks. You know, we might have a material producer, a processor, a distributor, some retailers, and finally some consumers. And all these actors, they have very differing targets and very differing expectations. And that's, a big challenge for such products, you know, that they have to fulfill the need and expectations of all these actors on the different levels of these value networks. And finally, they also have to work well for the consumers and users. So this is something I think that we always must take into account. We do not talk about simple products. We talk about complex systems. And Currently, it's the case that basically these biodegradable plastic products are niche applications, normally in conventional plastic product networks. So that means we do not have a special organization or management for this type of products. And we hardly take into account the requirements of these specific biodegradable, biodegradable plastic products. My second remark goes in direction of the marketing mix instruments. And there we have four classical P's and I will go through these P's briefly and give some, some insights. The first is about the product. And we must take into account that biodegradability is only one characteristic of products. And a consumer normally will, uh, choose a product as a combination of different product attributes and biodegradability might not be the most important attribute for consumers when purchasing a product. Just think about you buy a food product, so you buy the food, maybe the yogurt, and not per se the biodegradable plastic packaging. And even for people who are quite environmentally can conscious, Often, in also for this type of people, biodegradability might not be in their core field of interest. They might more think about climate change or biodiversity or other issues. If I talk about prices, then we all know that a competitive pricing is really relevant that uh, products strongly and fastly can penetrate markets. But there we have the problem that most of the biodegradable products are more expensive than their conventional counterparts. So that means 
that these higher prices are important barriers in cost sensitive areas, maybe the packaging field or in markets where we have a substantial proportion of price sensitive consumers. What might be the case for food products or apparels or fast moving consumer goods. If we talk about distribution, then we have the problem that biodegradable products currently are mainly niche uh, products in the assortment of large retailers. Think about food retailers. So it's often very difficult for consumers that they really find them, that they recognize them. And on the other hand, it's very really difficult for the producers to come into the shelves of these big retailers since they have often only small sales volume, at least at the beginning when they introduce such products. And let me end with some communication aspects. There we have to say that the end use, end of use aspects, you know, this is normally not the key focus of commercial activities of companies. And we already heard about all these labeling issues and these different points. So that makes biodegradability a very complex issue to communicate to consumers. And in commercial communication, often emotional approaches are preferred. You know, they have a higher performance for the, for the companies. But this counteracts with the fact-based information needs that we have in the biodegradability field. So thank you. You're on mute. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yep. Just trying to unmute myself. Um, thank you very much. My name is Samantha Fahey, and I am the Sustainability Manager at Dublin City University. Um, and I want to thank the um, organizers for the opportunity to speak on this, um, this topic. I was not involved in the actual creation of the report, but very much welcome, its, um, welcome the report. It's not usual that sustainability gets put in the same section with marketing. They don't um, usually be the, um, the same bedfellows um, in that marketing is trying to promote consumption and sustainability is typically trying to reduce consumption. But given this, I guess, from sustainability perspective and, and our climate and biodiversity emergency, the need that we will have from marketing to actually help us um, deliver on all of the solutions, I think is going to be really important. When I look at this report, I guess I kind of look at the waste hierarchy. And if I start at the top of it and looking at the, the reduction of waste and I go, okay, well, as well as reduction, we need to look at the prevention of waste. And there is a huge amount of confusion about compostable plastics and fossil fuel based plastics and biodegradable plastics and all the different levels of plastics. And I guess from my perspective, the best thing we can do is try to prevent the plastics being used in the first place, because in the end, if we can prevent it at the start, then we don't have to worry about the waste streams of it. But there's lots of challenges to doing that. How do we change the actual system? And there's been a lot of talk about the system and how um, the different aspects of the system. I think we really need to, to actually tackle the challenges that we face is to rethink how we actually, whether it is the packaging of food, how we display it in stores, the entire process by which we go through, how do we move to much more reusable and not just reusable cups, so the cups, compostable cups going into the, the wrong bins, but how do we take it back to going back to using single use cups or sorry, to using reusable cups so people bring their own cups? But also, how do you go to taking those packaging out of the supermarkets so that you don't have each piece of food singly wrapped in, in a piece of plastic? And I recognize that there's uses for it in that it reduces food waste significantly. But we have to figure out a way of how we use that behavioral change, how we use the marketing, how we use the engagement to engage and communicate with the general public on how we need to make all those changes. But I don't think we can actually push all this down to the general public for everybody to actually make the changes. I think when we look at, we'll say the plastics, how can we go back to manufacturers and go, can we not really, as Wouter said, simplify the whole system, not just with the labels, but can we 
potentially just go, we're going to have two types of plastic. We're going to have a soft plastic and we're going to have a hard plastic. And one of them is going to be orange and one of them is going to be purple. And that's the waste stream. And, and that just takes it straight down to the end. And, and we need marketing then to come in and go, OK, we need to work with the um, consumer or the the businesses who really want their products to be marketed and get them to actually use um, or to be see to see the use of these streamlined um, plastics as a positive marketing tool rather than a negative one. And I guess overall, my point would be that we need to change the, what we're doing so that we start to live within our environmental means rather than just looking at it from our economic means. I think I'll leave it there and, and see what questions come in on us. Thank you both very much indeed. So we've got a range of interesting questions coming in. That they're not necessarily just focused on the last topic. And I think I'm going to do as I did before and, and open these up to the, to the whole panel. Um, there's, there's quite an interesting one that I think uh, one of the panelists has, in, uh, has typed an answer to, but I'm just wondering what the evidence is. And uh, it's received quite a few votes. Said, you know, is there evidence really that people are willing to, to pay more to do the right thing? Or will they only do the right thing if it doesn't cost them uh, any more? So about the cost of some of these interventions, or, you know, could it actually be the case that, yes, yeah, some people would pay more for, from respect to the environment? What's, what's the evidence base there? Would anybody like to take that one? Well, I can say a little bit about it. We're doing a project um, within the university that's looking at getting rid of lab-based plastics. And we have done a survey of over it's several hundred um, researchers looking at their use of lab-based plastics and moving from the fossil fuel-based plastics to biodegradable. And there has been a distinct number of them that have actually said that they would be willing to actually pay more to actually use a less environmentally impactful plastic than what they're currently using. No, thank you. Maybe, maybe I, I, I yeah, could go add, ahead, please, Klaus. Yes, I, thank you. I can add two points there. We we have done several yes choice experiments on on bio-based plastics, different products, and we normally find very heterogeneous opinions there. But maybe one third depends on the product of the people are willing maybe to pay more for such products. And we have just recently done a field experiment, it's not published, where we sold uh, some tomatoes in different uh, plastic uh, bags and pots. And we, people really had to buy more if it was bio-based and biodegradable. And there we find that they did pay around 10 to 20 cent more for a product that normally costs uh, 152 euros. So I think you will find some consumers, but not all of them, that might be willing to really pay more. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Klaus. There's a, there's a question that's come in actually several times in different ways, and it's it's almost a philosophical question. It's it's kind of opinion based, and it's a bit you know what I would call in English chicken and egg. You know what needs to come first? It, it, so the questions one of these questions, and there's a few similar says. There is no waste stream for bio-based plastics and biodegradable waste where I live. What do you think could, should come first? You know, should it be that the, the waste stream comes first and then the product should be designed to fit the waste stream? Or does the product come first uh, and then the waste stream must follow? What, what, what would be the logical uh, response to, to that, any other panel? Which should come first, the product or the waste stream? Um, I, I can say say a little bit of uh, about that, and it's something that we cover uh, in, in a report, and, and it's a question that's almost impossible to, to answer, but what is important is, is that you need to consider both. You know, you can't talk about behavior or behavior change policies without thinking uh, about the infrastructure. And that was also a point that uh, Sabina uh, made uh, earlier. So it's not an either or, it is about, you know, addressing both, so to have behavior change policies that fit with the infrastructure and vice versa, uh, but it's incredibly complex. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it makes me think, Voucher, of some labeling I've seen where, you know, the manufacturer is putting a label on that says something like widely recyclable or something like that. I mean, it, 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 would, seem, it, seem, it would seem crazy to propose an answer where actually there was only one plant somewhere in Europe that could deal with it. 
and then and then and then try to imagine that it that it was genuinely recyclable. So I think it's exactly as you say. You need to 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 bring the two together, really. And and again, to repeat what Sabina says, it's not only about standardization of uh, labeling and certification schemes, but also about standardizations of of waste streams and collections. Yes. Um. While you're looking at the questions, yes. Richard, can I add to that? I mean, it's a really interesting question. What should be the scope or the, the, the level of standardization? Because it might be much, much too ambitious to do this at the national level or even the European level. There are also different constraints because waste management systems vary country to country. And I'm not sure what the right answer is. How, how small or how big should the standardization be? Uh, it just occurred to me as I was listening to this. Yeah, the scale of the standardization is, is yeah, is, is really, really important to that. So there's a number of different factors. It certainly isn't straightforward. Um, OK, um, we we've got a question or oh, well, really a comment here um, coming in. We did some research on bio based and found European consumers don't understand bio based. But if they know something is made of plants, plant based, they think it's biodegradable. So it's about the carbon source driving people to conclusions. There's a lot of confusion about this, it might lead to the wrong behavior. Does anybody want to comment on that? It strikes me as a comment about the, you know, the perceptions that might be driven by where the carbon is coming from, the plant-based, yeah. I, I would fully support this opinion. You know, people normally don't know anything about bio-based. We also have done several research in Germany and if you ask them questions, they don't know anything about it. They might even know more about biodegradable, but I think they normally think it's compostable and normally home compostable. You know, that's their level of experience that what, what people normally know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just, we've got, there's not, um, we've got a couple more minutes left. There's not an obvious question from the chat. I'm wondering if, if I could put one and I'm, I'm just curious for, for the, the panel's views, you know, when the consumer goes shopping and I'm thinking of some food stuff that's packaged, do we expect them to understand all of these terms, the bio-based, the plant-based, the biodegradables, or, or should we actually be working towards a marketplace where the consumer can shop with confidence, knowing that the packaging can be handled by wide scale end of life facilities and that actually the, what they're choosing is the thing that's in the packaging rather than having to agonize over understanding all the labels. You know, where do we want to be if we were to crystal ball gaze in, in, in a decade's time? I would not expect that any consumer can understand this and for Consumer, it's maybe not also in the core of its, his or her interest. You know, they, they might have much other problems uh, what, that really bother them. So if we cannot make this system also simple and maybe find some ways also to, to get it easier sorted and, and technically sorted and, and put these in the right recycling streams, I think this is a very difficult issue then if we all depend on consumer behavior it's it's very really difficult and complex that we can solve it yeah yeah no I, I can see it so there's a lot of I feel a lot of resonance for resonance and agreement for the idea of of simplification you know I, I sometimes hear this statement the consumer doesn't understand uh, as though it's uh, you know a, a, a school a school student that hasn't you know understood understood the topic of discussion very well and Actually, the, you know, should we be hoping the consumer understands everything or should we be simplifying it to 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 make it compatible with the consumer? OK, um, so how are we doing for time? We're going to need a comment. Yeah. Could I uh, add a little bit more? more Please. To that? Uh, because yeah. you know we often talk about behavior change and let's say the solutions lies with the consumer but that puts a lot of onus on the consumer right so we're not talking about consumption only it's about production and consumption and the, the two sides of the same coin yeah and that is what we have to consider but also if you're looking at uh, uh, key messages we say the, the terminology related to bio-based and biodegradable plastics is incongruent with public understandings of the term which is something different than saying that consumers don't understand it and it's the same with the usage of materials 
it's not only about consumers doing the right or the wrong thing, it's also about producers and retailers doing the right or the wrong thing. Yeah, consumers, they don't want to pollute the environment, but they do want to go on with their day-to-day -day life. And when they go to the shop and they buy a product, you know, th that that is just part of their day-to-day -day life. And, and they should not have to make that effort. It's actually the, the, the you know, producers and the retailers uh, th that need to consider that. And that's also the, the idea of the extended uh, producer uh, responsibility. Yeah, thank you, Varta. That's a really, a, a really good point about, you know, whose behavior is it we need to change, perhaps? Is it, it, yeah. Um, okay. So I think, yeah, we're pretty much actually bang on time. So if that's okay, thank you very much. Uh, to, uh, to Klaus and Samantha, and I'm gonna move on to the next topic, which relates to uh, policy aspects. And that's uh, Sylvia and, and Liam. I don't know who's gonna go first. I, I, I can start, uh, but you. I don't see, oh, okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for this very topical, timely and inspirational webinar for, uh, for us in the European Commission. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is there only to set political context of the uh, European Commission, of the uh, von der Leyen European Commission. As you see, we have the European Green Deal as one of the, the big transfor transformative changes we have to, uh, uh, to carry out. The other one being uh, the digital one. So this is the green one, the green transfor transformative change we want to, uh, to carry out. And what does it mean? It means that we have to move to a climate neutral, resource efficient and competitive economy. We think that to achieve these objectives, uh, a circular economy is key. And what does it mean? It means an economy where the value of products, materials and resources is maintained in the economy for as long as possible and the generation of waste is minimized. Um, according to the Circular Economy Action Plan, we have a number, a very long number of actions to carry out. And these are the three uh, main areas where we are working, where we are focused on, is the Sustainable Product Initiative, the key value chain where we see that the potential for circularity is still high, and then the part on less waste and more value. Plastics is one of these key value chains where the potential for circularity is still high. And this was already a highlight in the uh, European Union strategy for plastics of 2018. Next slide, please. So the topic of today is um, uh, biodegradable plastics. And also bio-based, I'm happy because you mentioned bio-based and this is also uh, something we focus on. And the policy framework which was announced in the uh, new Circular Economy Action Plan is actually a policy framework which will apply to bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics. Three words we are all struggling with, but that where we have to bring uh, uh, clarity. At least this is our objective to bring clarity. And uh, this slide uh, shows uh, the studies that have been finalized or are being finalized in order to help us uh, to design this uh, policy framework. We call it a policy framework. It will take the form of a communication, of a commission's communication. And this communication is due for next year. So we have finalized uh, uh, studies on the bio-based uh, part, uh, on the compostable part. Here, uh, the focus was really on something which was very much mentioned today, the cross-contamination of waste streams. Conclusions say that there is an environmental benefit in using compostable plastics if the product is not recyclable or reusable, if it helps uh, capture bio-waste, and if we maintain a good quality of compost. And then we have the biodegradable part, which is the topic of today, where we have, and we are extremely uh, grateful for this uh, study finalized by the chief scientific advisors uh, with the help of the SAPIA experts, and then a study on agricultural plastics. I see that the, 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 the 
the yeah it's not very visible but there is also a study on agricultural plastics so the use of plastics both conventional and biodegradable in agriculture next slide please here i will not repeat what has already been said in the previous interventions we agree that uh, because we also see that there is consumer confusion and we ask ourselves uh, how can we distinguish between uh, conventional tray, compostable tray, bio-based tray, etc. So we also think and we also see that there are possible unintended effects and this was very much uh, explained uh, and described by previous interventions, especially if applications coexist. So, I mean, if we go uh, to the supermarket and we buy, uh, product like uh, packaging, plastic uh, packaging, we see that there, there are plenty of materials that are used for the same applications. So we may have in the end compostable plastics ending up with non-compostable and vice versa. I saw that there was a question in the chat on evidence uh, regarding these cross-contamination of waste streams. We are told that uh, we, Recyclers uh, complain about uh, the fact that the compostable plastics end up in the, uh, in the recycling bin. But we are also told uh, by stakeholders that there is a huge, huge contamination of, uh, uh, of the compost. So uh, the, the, the conventional plastics ending up with the compostable. Uh, plastics, so huge contamination of compost, a huge contamination of soil. And then you have other possible situations. You have industrially compostable plastics ending up with the home compostable, and you have plastics that biodegrade in soil that end up in waterways or sea where they are not intended, an environment, a receiving environment they are not intended for. And then we have an, some more, some more unintended effects. I will not, I will not uh, insist on this, but uh, these are all situations where we want to know more, uh, where we want to push further the analysis, uh, because these are all situations uh, that are important for us when considering biodegradable or compostable plastics. Next slide, please. We have said that um, the infrastructure is an important element and the infrastructure should be there when, before, after the product. I think that what we have seen so far is that uh, the product was there, but the infrastructure was not there. So there is certainly now a focus to be put on infrastructure and collection and sorting technology, etc. Labeling also matters, of course, and you have uh, uh, chief scientific advisors and uh, supply experts. You have said that labeling should cover many things, should cover the receiving environment, should cover the plastic use, should cover the disposal instructions, should cover the time scale and the conditions for full biodegradation, a lot of things. And here, I also ask you whether this is a simple thing to do or if it is not too much for even educated consumers. And we know that there is a need for <laughs> simplification, but this, this is uh, really uh, challenging because uh, we want to bring a clarity, we don't want to bring a complexity and add a complexity to complexity. So the, the labels are certainly an important uh, element to be considered. They may help, but we also know from also your uh, work that they may not always work or not for everyone. So here, uh, what we are doing now in preparing this uh, policy uh, framework, we are exploring some scenarios uh, and we see that there is a coexistence scenario where um, the same product, the same application is made of conventional and also of biodegradable compostable plastics. Uh, and this is the coexistence scenario. And there, of course, uh, the labeling is very important. Uh, 
We are also exploring some other scenarios. For instance, should some applications be biodegradable? I'm thinking here of some applications, very few, but let's think of, for instance, of fireworks. What about having fireworks that are made of biodegradable plastics? Because we know that we will not uh, be able, we will never be able to collect them. Uh, all these things will be addressed in the policy framework. So, and I go back to the beginning, the definitions. Again, we don't want to add complexity to complexity, but we see, we see a need for clarity on the definitions. We see that there is a need of clarity on the applications where the use of these plastics makes sense. We need, of course, a criteria to identify such applications and the work of the chief scientific advisor and of the SAPER experts that have very much helped on this. And we have, of course, the issue of cross-contamination of waste streams. Here, it has been said that it's also an issue of infrastructure. And I agree with those saying that it's not easy because infrastructure is not just for the EU level to regulate. There is a subsidiary uh, subsidiarity uh, in these. So, and we see it, uh, for instance, for compostable plastics and for uh, facilities, that there are some facilities accepting compostable plastics and there are other facilities that do not accept the compostable plastics. So here it's even within the same member state, we see that from region to region, things may change, acceptance may change. Uh, the policy framework will look at all these things and will, uh, will uh, we are needed, also indicate some follow-up actions. I repeat, the policy framework will take the form of a communication, so it will not be a leg legislative act, but we will, uh, where needed, say also where a follow-up action is needed. Uh, in the end, I would like to say that the input of uh, behavioral sciences for us is absolutely something we desire. So for us, it is desirable that behavioral sciences provide their input uh, to explore all these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And I, and I hand swiftly to Liam. We're running a little bit behind I, I, I time, Liam. Yes, thank you, Richard. Uh, and thank you, Sylvia, and, and the other panelists. Uh, my name is Liam Carr, and I'm at NUI Galway, here in Galway. And uh, like Samantha, I was not a part of the report that was, uh, that's being published. Uh, however, uh, do support uh, its outcomes and as importantly, its extensions and, and what the next steps might be. What I would like to uh, briefly uh, kind of run through um, we've been presented the issue. We know what the issues are. Uh, there is, in addition to a circular economy and, and, this, and this drive to uh, maintain functional use of any material, doesn't matter what it is, as long as possible, extending lifespans, there's also a policy life cycle. And the, the circular policy life cycle is identifying the issues, figuring out the targeted behaviors that will address those issues and then developing sensible policies that can lead to uh, actualized changes. And, and then they can be behavioral changes, they can be production changes, they can be consumer changes, they can be additional policy changes. And here in Ireland, one of the, uh, the great things that have been going on over the last several years is a uh, committed attention to single-use plastics and extending uh, the circular economy and, and extending the lifespan through reuse programs, through reduction programs, through educational programs. And a lot of this can still be furthered. That is um, absolutely a necessary case. Um, but here in Ireland, we have a couple things that have um, helped to generate this change and extending uh, extending the lifespan of and utility of things, you know, things as 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 clickbaity as the uh, so-called latte levy about disposable cups, um, to more formal uh, education programs and and recognitions within government to uh, delegate authority from the national to the regional to local authorities, so that that the that the people on the ground 
can have, uh, can be empowered to do their own part, to make their own responsibility, um, to, to address whatever that great interest might be. So what I wanna do, um, rather than run through, you can read the report, you can also read um, the Waste Action Plan for the Circular Economy, which was published here in Ireland uh, last year. You can read all that sort of stuff in your own spare time. What I would like to do um, in kicking it back to Richard is just ask everybody to consider what your own responsibilities are. And on the policy side of things, we have a number of responsibilities. Some are producer partnerships, some are consumer partnerships. Um, and if you pay attention to what those responsibilities might be, you can generate a leveraged response that moves towards that actualized change in behavior that we're all looking to address. So uh, with that, thank you very much. I see there's been a number of amazing questions and I'll let Richard uh, work those through. Uh, thank you, Liam. No, it's, it's, it's a really good point. And in, you know, the, the many meetings I've been involved in over the years, it's, it's always felt like there was somebody that wasn't present in the dialogue uh, and nearly always those that were present wanted to make it that 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 sector of the supply chain's fault or responsibility. And it's a really key point you make. We all have a stake to, to solving this. Um, th there's a, well, we're looking at the questions that are quite high in the chat. And again, they're, they're, well, this one, I think, to me, it relates to both the social sciences. Well, all three aspects, really, the marketing and particularly the policy. Um, how wide would we say is widely recyclable? You know, the label could be used as greenwash. I think I think the underlying comment here is, I, I would try to phrase it to, first of all, to the behavioral scientists who've made the point about simplifying the types of plastic. What do we need to do with the types of, of labeling? And then I would want to put that to, to the policy about how do we make sure um, that if we need to rely on certain labels, whatever they might be, how do we make sure that those labels are used in an appropriate way and don't somehow lead to more confusion. So firstly, I don't know if there's one of the psychologists that would that would like to chip in about, you know, in principle, what are we trying to do with labeling? Is it is it is it as straightforward as keeping it as simply as possible? And then we go to the policy, I think, just to, to ask how do we then reinforce and police that? Sabina, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think from my point of view, for, from the behavioral sciences, a label is an instruction to do something. So it's directly linked to the behavior and it should have that function, but it relies on the, how good is the label? Does it actually, is it not greenwash? Does it actually tell you properly what to do? And can you trust what happens with it? And maybe to Danielle's question as well, I think a label such as widely recyclable is not very useful because I don't know what it, means it's sort of a response to a system that varies widely but i i don't know it i, I don't think it's very useful to be honest yeah so then to 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 policy then i mean how do we you can, can you give me instances in this in this sphere of plastics where well there's a, a a useful labeling standard that's that's protected in terms of its communication to the consumer or is it just a free-for-all in terms of you know, what label is stuck on what project product? And if that's the case, how do we improve that? Richard, I think that's, I think that's a really good question. And, and I know it was mentioned earlier uh, in the Q and A um, about the, the, the risk of greenwashing and the, and the potential need to uh, develop either legislation or, or policies and plans to provide incentives for uh, not just a, a, an organized system of labeling, but a coherent system of labeling that, that consumers and, and everybody down the line uh, can make sense of. And, and that confusion around what is biodegradable, what is not biodegradable, is biodegradable compostable? Is compostable the same as other things? Um, is something that, again, is, uh, it's been well addressed. And there are notions uh, in terms of developing what some of these um, responses might be shame might be able to come on come in here um, on on some of the on, on some of what kind of label looks good um, such that it can kind of um, increase proper responses while also simultaneously addressing the concerns over greenwashing which I think um, is not fully addressed yet and has not been um, uh, specific, specifically resolved uh, within existing policies. 
Oh, thanks, Lynn. Does anyone else want to come in there? Sh I, I also think that labels uh, tell us about what we have to do. So our source of instruction. So I agree with Sabine. And what we are seeing uh, um, for bio-based plastics, we see that we are told that uh, there is not uh, a big link between labeling of bio-based plastics, for instance, and sustainability of those plastics. So here again, we have to be careful. Labels uh, can help uh, for a communication to consumers, but uh, the sustainability issue is still there and is not solved by, label, by labels. We have, for instance, to have some, some sort of sustainability criteria, some sort of certification, because in this sense, we can ensure that the product is truly uh, sustainably sourced, for instance. Thanks, Sylvia. And I mean, we, we're pretty much on time. There's a question that's been high on the list for a while, which is about education, and we haven't talked about that. Um, it's asking, you know, education is critical to any change. Um, is that an important consideration when introducing a new type of plastic? Should education uh, be important? And it's asking, are educational resources being developed to use internationally? And, and I suppose I would say to, to that, as we, I'd like to, some, some comments on the link between education, the importance of it, but also whose responsibility is that education? You know, the questioner sort of almost implies that if a manufacturer were to come up with a new product, the, the, the responsibility would sit with, with that supplier to develop the education stream. But where, where does the, the responsibility for, for, for the education that's needed, where, where does it lie? So, so how important is it and who's responsible? Uh, Richard, if I could just come in there on the on the, the first aspect of the question anyway, I think I, I might leave the, the second part to the to the policy experts. Um, but on, on the first part, we actually in multiple areas that we work. So in the environmental space, as well as like the financial space and the health space, we actually find educational approaches to not be as effective as other approaches. It seems to be the case that um, you're, you're getting the education not at the point of time where you need it. So the, the sort of point of sale interventions tend to be the ones that might be might be a bit more effective. Not to say that it's it's never going to be effective or that it wouldn't be effective in this space, but I think on the on the back of previous research, it's probably not where I'd be betting. Um, that those sort of point of sales so of the I know it's it's cropped up a lot, but the the simplified labels that are shown to give consumers and end users the information that they think they're getting from it to help them make the more informed decisions. I think that's that's where we need to get to. But um, yeah, a lot easier said than done. Thanks, yeah. Shane. If I could follow up on that. Side. Yeah. yeah, Richard. Yeah. Um, if I could just follow up on, on Shane's uh, last part into the second part. Um, I think what we're looking for is an acknowledgement and being okay with incremental change. In Ireland, we're, we've, we're on our way this summer to be banning single-use plastics, but it is a periodic change by 2024, there will be additional bans on additional types of plastic bottles. And by 2030, there's going there's a there's a target for the reuse of recycled plastics into new products. And so, hoping for some change overnight um, is one of the is one of the fallacies of education. Education is a lifelong sort of thing. And so, recognizing that every little bit that's good is better than than expecting you know, some grand transformation. Um, and it's, and, and that, and that is, that comes through with some of the policies that um, Ireland are, are chasing down. Thank, thank you, Liam. And I think that's a really nice and positive uh, unifying way to end. So I'd like to thank, you know, all of the presenters this afternoon and, and also particularly the, the audience. We had nearly 150 people online at one stage and we've had some fantastic questions come in and I'm sorry that we couldn't answer uh, answer all of those questions. There's there's a final uh, short slot in, in the agenda, which is called Meet the Artist. And um, the artist behind the, some of the artwork that you've seen being presented here is, is an artist called um, Heather Nunn. And I, you know, as it happens, she was actually a student at my own university, at the University of Plymouth. She's, I, I'm a marine biologist. She was a fine artist. Um, 
But this art was actually created with, with, with plastic litter. Heather won a, a sustainability award at the university and the same image uh, was used back in 2016. And the way she makes these pictures is, is quite interesting. And I guess, why do we raise this in this context? Because there are a variety of ways we can communicate about, about the message. And, and Heather's way of communicating was to take pieces of plastic litter, plastic, plastic bags, and to scrunch them up and to use them as a material for printing different inks onto, onto the page. And she's come up with these beautiful images. Some of them are local seascapes uh, near to where, where I live in the Southwest of England. And, and so, you know, as a, as a final kind of parting to, to this session, it's really just to, to, to raise awareness of different interpretations of the problem. And uh, certainly for me, it, it, really, it really excites me to see different artistic representations of of aspects of the of the challenge of litter in the environment. I, I see them as far more exciting, let's say, than the scientific papers that I, I might write myself. But again, it's back to that question of what does the, I want to say consumer, uh, there's Heather, I want to say consumer, um, but actually it's really the general public. What do they what do they make when they see uh, art like this? Heather is, unfortunately couldn't be with us today. So I've done my best to, um, uh, to 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 cover that slot uh, on on her behalf and yeah lots of interesting questions about how do we use art as a means of helping to to tell to tell the story and to to facilitate the messaging so I think I, I need to we haven't got time to answer questions about that I need to stop there I'm going to hand back uh, to Ollie Peterson who will close thank you well uh, thank you very much uh, Richard for chairing this session so well I think we had a very lively and very interesting and informative discussion. So first of all, I want uh, on behalf of SAPEA and Academia Europea to thank uh, all speakers for having given very concise and incisive presentations, which gave rise, as I said, to a very good uh, discussion. Warm thanks, particularly to Richard for uh, really uh, masterminding discussion so well. Many thanks to the Royal Irish Academy for, for joining us in this and uh, Brian Norton for representing them. And of course, many thanks to uh, Sapir organizers, uh, Toby Wortman and uh, Luis also from Academia Europea for also having worked hard behind the scenes and several others, uh, which will take too much time uh, to go into now. So it just remains to say that uh, it, it continues, of course, the webinars uh, relating to this uh, SAPIA uh, evidence review report. And we have another one coming up uh, on the 16th of June, as you can see on the screen, which is chaired by uh, a member of the European Parliament. And so that is an interesting event. So if you have enjoyed today's uh, event, then please uh, tune in also on the 16th of June. And as previously mentioned, uh, this whole session has been recorded and will soon be available for everybody to listen again or to transmit to other people. So I have to conclude this webinar now. Many, many thanks, and also to the very many people who are listening. We're a very good audience today, as Richard said, and that's very satisfactory indeed. So I close this session now. <laughs>